What about Trent RT? TRT, but with Trent. Mm. Trent RT. <laughs> Trent RT. <laughs> you like that one? That's that's terrible. That's very irresponsible. <laughs> just like a natural replacement dose of trend. That's all I'm talking. Yeah, yeah. Because your body produces trend quite a lot, actually. It's, it produces it's about 100 milligrams every other day. If you want to get scientific, Dave. Yes, it's it's produced by the trend trenolosi cells. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Drugs and Stuff with Dave Crossland. All of our programming is brought to you by evalbloodanalysis.com. If you're in the UK, you can get your lab work done by Dave. Go to evalbloodanalysis.com. We're brought to you by supplementsource.ca for Canadians. They have great deals that change week to week. Strom Sports Nutrition. For those of you in the UK, they've got great health and performance supplements, great health stacks, and truenutrition.com. Use our code THINK over there for high quality third-party tested supplements, great carb powders, protein, everything else. Get your creatine, everything else you can think of. And thank you to everybody from Patreon. I think we have some Patreon questions today. David, you ready to answer some questions for the listeners? You said I have to. You do. It's part of your contract, really. I want to see this contract. I've never seen this contract. I want <laughs> you never signed any contract? You don't remember that? <laughs> <laughs> I believe I was drugged. Possibly, possibly. Speaking of drugs, um, I'm going to try a new experiment. <laughs> Melanotin 2 nasal spray. Have you heard of this stuff? Yes. So here's the thing. It's been, it's been around for years. Yeah, here's the thing, man. I uh, I feel like I developed an aversion to uh, melanotin. Every time I took it, I'd get that like that nasty flush feeling and kind of a little bit like a little bit stomach turning feeling. So I, I and even at a tiny tiny dose. Now this stuff is ten milligrams total, and I think it's a uh, hundred micrograms per shot. It's written very small. Um, I mean per blast. So I'm thinking I'm going to give it a try and see what it does. And I'm just going to start with like one spray. I'll start. Let's see. Get this. There we go. Yeah, well, hold on a second. I'll be right back. Loading, loading, loading phase is usually one milligram per day, isn't it? <clears throat> Am I right with that? Am I getting that mixed up? No. Yeah, a lot of people used to do the one milligram. I found that it yeah. isn't super necessary. Um, if you just take it, it works. Now, I, I just took one spray. I did that off camera because I don't want to be seen like, you know, I don't want you to get mad at me. But yeah, this says uh, 100 micrograms. Per spray so i got this from that amino company that we don't talk about i would never use code in fact that code doesn't exist dave so why are you taking tan in anyway it's not like you go out in the sun well i want to get tan for the olympia i want to get a little a little bit of a base base tan you know what i'm saying skip's gonna be so there you do you realize how dark so skip is skip takes a ton of melanotin and he goes out on a boat in Florida every day. So are you are you going to hit the sunbeds then, seeing as the, the, the sunny time of year is leaving us? <laughs> I was kidding. This guy did a bump of Melanson too, LOL. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, so I'm going to try to get a little bit of a base tan going. We'll see. So far, I don't feel any of those uh, side effects that are spoken of, you know, with melanotin too. I don't feel like the hot, flushy feeling. I understand it's just 100 micrograms, but hey, we'll see what happens. Maybe I'll just do like 100 micrograms per day and see what happens over the next eight weeks. How about that? Okay. You upset, Dave? You look disappointed or something. I'm disappointed in you, yes. Should I be using a lot more? No, I don't understand why you're using it in the first place. Why not? That's the real don't, question. Don't go fall for the peer pressure from people around you. You are fine as you are, Scott. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I appreciate that. All right. Well, listen, we do have a bunch of listener questions. Um, we'll just start from the top. And guys, if you want to take part in the next show, we'd love to have you uh, leave questions so you can comment on this episode and uh, we'll tackle them on the following show. And everybody in the live stream, you guys are welcome to uh, to comment with questions too. Um, is there any way to run trend without side effects, Dave? It, it's trends. One of them drugs it'll affect you or it won't. 
Um, the problem is with it, there's sort of no way to preempt that. I mean, obviously, if you're an actually anxious person, you've already got issues around anxiety, then it's probably not a drug you really want to be looking at. Um, but, you know, I know plenty of people that run trend with no problems. But then I also know plenty of people that have run trend with no problem, and then all of a sudden, that one cycle, it all goes peaked on and then they have problems with it ever from that point onwards so uh, it, it can just jump up and bite you on the ass um and it, it it just seems to be people will get to a certain point of repetitive usage and and they just can't cope with it anymore but um i don't particularly know of you could potentially take a whole host of supplements lion's mane and god knows what else to try and offset some of the neural impacts hmm. But uh, is it going to work? Maybe to some extent. But then I'd start to argue is uh, is if you're having to do that much management around a drug, yeah, is it really worth bothering with? Yeah, I, I get your point. When I think of sides, I think of like the transomnia and irritability and stuff like that. Um, and I'll tell you what, man, the first time I ran it, it was, it used to be dosed at 75 or 76 milligrams per milliliter when I first started using it. And yeah, uh, was 76. well, it's changed now. And every, every trend ACE is a hundred and every trend E is 200. So anyway, first time I ran it, it was like 75 or whatever, every other day, along with a hundred probe every other day. And I got all the sides. I felt like more anxiety. I felt just crappy overall. But I was like, oh, man, you're supposed to, with a cycle, you're supposed to like feel crappy and you just tolerate it and you keep looking better. So it's worth it. And I don't feel that way anymore. And I didn't feel like that after that cycle. I was like, oh, I never want to do it again. Eventually, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it again. <laughs> so what I ended up doing, though, Dave, was I said, okay, I'm just going to start at 25 every other day. And I'll see what that does. At the time, man, nobody was taking less than 400, okay? Um, so I started with 25 every other day. And I was like, okay, yeah. I, I don't really feel a ton of effect, but I also don't feel any side effects. And I think I'm a little bit stronger. Why don't I bump it up a little bit? So like a couple weeks in, I went to like 37.5 every other day or 40 every other day. And then I went to 50 every other day. I slowly built it up over the course of like five weeks. And I, I got used to it. Like, I didn't deal with the same sides as I had when it all blasted me at once. So I, I kind of feel like for me, at least for the, you know, like the physical sides, the, the noticeable sides of trend starting very low and slowly building it over the course of five, six weeks made a big difference for me versus just hitting the throttle all at once. Yeah, I could see that. I could see progressing it would, would, would potentially help. I mean, we see that with quite a lot of compounds, don't we? Clen being a very obvious one that jumps to mind that True. if you titrate that dose up, it, it's usually much better tolerated. Same with growth hormone, though, as well. If you, if you, you, you'll find you can handle much higher doses of growth if you start low and just build it over time. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So if you just. <sighs> I mean, it's not going to mitigate any, like, kidney stuff, or you know what I mean? It's like... No, and I just think you do get to a point with Trent where you just get to a point where you it, it goes off the list. Um, <laughs> you, 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 well, I do. I just get... I think people get to a point with Trent where they just cannot cope with it anymore, irrespective of the dose they use. What about Trent um, RT? TRT, but with Trent. Um, Trent RT. <laughs> Trent RT. <laughs> <laughs> you like that one? That's that's terrible. that's very irresponsible. <laughs> Just like a natural replacement dose of trend. That's all I'm talking. Yeah, yeah. Because your body produces trend quite a lot, actually. It's it produces about 100 milligrams every other day. If you want to get scientific, Dave. Yes, it's it's produced by the trend <laughs> trenolosi cells. Okay, so I'm going to be completely honest with you. I feel a little bit of that kind of stomachy feeling from 100 micrograms of lantern. So you're going to be sick live on air. <laughs> Do I look more red now? Am I starting to like flush? Because I feel like I look more red than when we started the show. You always look red. I just put it down to your blood pressure and ignore it. <laughs> yeah, Dave, thanks. Thanks, Dave. It's a pleasure. No, yeah, I'm starting to like, I'm starting to get like flushed feeling from 100 micrograms. Um, Whew. I need a drink here. 
I mean, would you would you now consider using Trent again? Um, I mean, dude, I'm not going to really use anything right now. You know what I'm saying? And it, I'll be no, honest, no, if, if, you if would, I were, I, you know, I, I'm not really interested to tell you the truth. But if I were, I, I could see keeping it at a low dose. Yeah, I'm definitely getting like that stomachy feeling from the melanotin, just like you would from a shot. Um, I'd keep it. Yeah, there's no question. I would keep it at a low dose. Okay. Like low, low 30 every other day, something like that, just to help kind of, you know, kind of like a TRT plus kind of thing where I'm on cycle, but it's not like a legit hard run. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 I could see that. Back. Probably not. Though. I just wondered if you'd go back to it now, you know, having the career you've had within bodybuilding and it's not in the sense of but as in within your usage and everything else would you would you then go back to it now because one thing i have noticed is the number of people that we test now the using trend is actually minimal really we used to get, you know, used because obviously we ask people what they're on when we test them uh, and we get a lot a lot of people on trend two years ago they, they don't do now, it now. No, we don't get many at all. It really seems to have dropped in favor for a lot of people, particularly off season anyway. They're all into the primo now, you know, primo and mast. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Every fucking cycle, primo, mast, and test. Yeah. All right. Let me see what else we have here. Um,. How about this one? Uh, love the show. Question for the next episode. What do you recommend protocol for early onset gyno tenderness behind the nipple and could feel a small lump? Uh, he says nothing visible at the moment. Well, the first thing would be to first line of defense would be a serum Nova, some sort of estrogen blocker um, to try and reduce the impact at the nipple. The rest would really depend on what you're doing drug-wise, whether you need yeah. to implement estrogen management. I mean, likelihood is you need some form of estrogen management put in place. But if, if prolactin is high, that's going to increase uh, receptor sensitivity and the number of receptors there as well. So that will need to be managed as well. Yeah, let's say it's just like a test cycle or a test base and you know maybe some uh, um, DHT. Well, then it's just a case of estrogen management. So I would put the Novadex in straight away and then I would test and see where you are and dose accordingly. But you could do a rough stab depending on what your test dose is as to where you need to be. Um, you know, I mean, sort of 500 mg, you're probably looking at half an 8x twice or three times a week would, would suffice for most people. Yeah. I had heard this explanation uh, years ago, and I liked it a lot. They said that an AI, okay, imagine a parking structure, and <clears throat> a, a no, CIRM, like a, like a Novadex, is basically going to keep cars from parking in the parking structure by putting a cone in each parking spot, versus yes. an AI, like a Remedex, is going to basically put a gate down to keep cars from coming into the complex. So... I like the combo, you know, Novadex to start to basically block up the parking spots, the estrogen receptors, and then let's get that under control by then maybe adding in an AI to, to bring the total number down. But like you said, get tested and see where you're at. Well, once once you get a handle on your estrogen, you can most likely drop the Novadex. But I would mm -hmm. throw that in immediately. Yeah. And then start working on managing the estrogen. Then once your estrogen is in a managed position, then you could quite well drop the Novadex. It wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for tuning in. And if we are providing value to you today, let me encourage you to subscribe and hit the bell. We have several bodybuilding podcasts that come out each week. All right. What else do we have here? How about this one? Um, how would you implement MENT into a cycle? I've been on and off for 15 years and used most things. I've just had five months off and looking to get back on soon. I've been offered meant, but uh, what other things would I be able to run with it? Thank you very much. Some cement needs to be taken as a suppository. Dave, that's not true. No, I like the analogy. I don't think you gave me enough credit for that analogy, Dave. I think you should have been wowed and told me how awesome it was. 
even though I didn't it really make it yours. up myself. You, yeah. <laughs> you stole it from somebody else, which is why I'm not giving you credit. I can't remember where I heard it, but it is a good one. It's a very good visual <laughs> picture. Ment is so strong, uh, man, you know? Uh, Ment, are we talking Ace or N? I asked him. He didn't tell me. So. Right. I uh, even saying that even with nth, I would probably start at around fifty milligrams, um, and then build from there. Um, it's definitely not a drug that I've had a lot of experience with running high. Yeah. So in most cases, I don't think I've ever put anyone over three, maybe four hundred at a max total. Um, and that's a pretty hefty whack with men. It is a very powerful drug. Yeah. Um, estrogen management is going to be a big concern, um, so he needs to be on top of that. Um, and I would preempt as well, so I would get stuff like Novadex in to start with already. Um, and you're going to need some form of estrogen management from the get go. So uh, I'd probably put a low dose ADEX or a low dose aromacin in as a start measure whatever uh, and then test and see if you need to bring it up higher to to get a better handle on it but um it's um yeah 50 milligram monday wednesday friday would be a, a start point i'd be looking at yeah that's and that's even in itself a i mean if it were if it were ace i, I think that sounds good um yeah i had very little negative sides running uh the acetate version uh, mm. And I, I did run it at 50 every other day uh, when I ran the long acting version at 100 every week. And that was with 600 test. I had no estrogen control in uh, at 600 test. Then I needed to start running a boatload of Arumidex, like a milligram every day with 100 milligrams of ment. And it's still what didn't suffice from what I understand. Uh, ment doesn't convert to estrogen. It converts to that synth to a synthetic form of estrogen. It's called like seven A yeah. methyl estradiol, and yeah, it's it, nasty. It's, it's man. Not, yeah, it is. It's not normal estrogen, um, and it is super super powerful in in that essence. It's a, it's a very impacting form. Uh, Debol is very similar, not quite to the same extent, but Debol converts to a, a very aggressive form of estrogen as well. Yeah. You know, I have a a client who um, he doesn't aromatize like anything, man. I think he's like uh, I, I actually have two guys in this position. They don't aromatize anything. One of them, uh, we've we've experimented with test, test and mass, test and EQ, test mass and EQ. Can't do test mass and EQ. His estrogen is like zilch, um, but he can do test and EQ. And his estrogen still wasn't great. And we blasted the test, man. We went up much higher in the test um, with a low dose of, uh, it was either Primo or Mast. Anyway, um, we added in five milligrams of ment every other day to see if we can get an estrogen effect for him. Um, and we're doing that right now. And so far, he seems to be doing good with it. Like he's feeling good. Strength is up. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's not going to be a, a enough meant to really have you know a strong effect at like 20 milligrams of acetate per week you know well they were they were looking um at meant as an alternative to trt mm -hmm. but the dosings it, it was it was some i mean i can't remember exactly but it was definitely something like 10 or you know 15 milligrams a week was the dosing yeah so we're doing like 20 yeah um just to try to support estrogen and i'll keep you guys posted as to how he does with it what about this one dave uh oh chase irons he commented he said thanks for the shout out gentlemen i appreciate the conversation and i just posted my mri results on five grams of gear on my channel for everyone to see the damage so you guys can go check out chase over there is 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 that a bit of a uh, sarcastic to see the damage? I there think is so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny, man, because uh, there are there are people who are, like they see that, and then they're real haters of Chase or 
uh, <laughs> guys like Paul Barnett, and they're like, "Oh man, you're going. This guy's going to die. He's just all juiced up, and it's terrible." You know? I I I wish him all the best, and I hope he does come out of it unscathed. But obviously, the more you push it, the more you push the risk. True. And there's there are other factors besides drugs alone that impact your health. All right. Okay. So we covered this before, but he keeps asking. I want to do this once and for all, one final time. He says, Scott, apart from protein and creatine, what are the other supplements that you would advise to take? Um, some people are uh, will consider electrolytes, BCAAs, etc. What would be bodybuilding supplements that you would advise? My, me personally, man, it depends on the individual and what their situation is, what their goals are, you know? Yeah, I mean, some of it is, is basic health support. So, Vit D. Yep, that's good. Lipo lipo liposomal Vit C. D with K. We want to use K. For yeah. like a, I think 125K for every um, 5,000 D. But, yeah, so so that would be one. Liposomal Vit C, just a gram, would be another. Um, if they're non assisted, then we shouldn't really need any any lipid support, so they wouldn't really be such an issue. You could put some in if you wanted to, but it would be less of a concern. Uh, a lot of that would depend on diet. And I mean, that's a big factor, isn't it? If the diet is where it should be, then the need for supplementary vitamins and minerals and things like that isn't really there. But if the diet is short, then obviously you need to start putting those things in to make up for where you're falling short with a diet. So if he if he's struggling with good sources of HDL in his diet, then stuff like krill oil, such as bergamot, are all going to help with that. Uh, creatinine, I think, without doubt, is probably the best single. You mean creatine? Sorry, I always yeah. Sorry, I've been reading blogs. <laughs> yeah, I do it all that's what time. I figured. You're reading labs yeah. and stuff. Uh, creatine is probably one of the most studied and one of the most supported effective supplements. Yeah. Um, other than that, I would say we're looking. If you want a product, I would say probably ZMA. Um, but it does seem to be very person dependent. I know people that use ZMA get a great night's nice sleep on it and see genuine strength benefits. But I also know people that it keeps them awake all night. They get no frigging sleep, and it actually sends them backwards. So, unfortunately, it's one of those products where you're just going to have to try it and see. Yeah. Um, again, depending on diet, you may want to look at a B complex. Um, it all depends on where you are with diet. And then you start going down specific. I'm, I'm not a big EA fan. EA? I don't mind them. Essentials. Amino oh, I acids. like essential amino acids. They're, they've been showing. So I wouldn't say everybody needs to be on them, but they no. have been showing 7 to 10 grams in studies to be beneficial. And they're going to help you to improve recovery. You, you don't have to do any type of digestion. They basically just permeate through your digestive tract into the bloodstream. And then they're going to go to help repair muscle to, you know, speed your recovery. Do you absolutely need it? People made out just fine for decades in bodybuilding without it. But if you wanted to add something, you know, then I think it, there's there's merit, you know. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a I'm not a big fan in the sense of I don't put them on an essentials list. But if you yeah. if you've got money, if you've got money to spend, and they're not going to do you any harm. Um, other than that, I don't really. I mean, you might look at something like an intra. Um, you know, if you specifically because of whatever reasons. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't see a, oh i'll tell you actually what i do like berberine berberine i yeah i don't use it for everyone but it's a great supplement hmm, i do it's like berberine. person dependent for me you know especially like somebody yeah. who has issues with blood sugar i like the i like what it does with with the bg and insulin sensitivity but the there is a sting it can knock your stomach up a little bit so and and then it becomes counterproductive so if you're gonna end if you do suffer with a bad stomach off berberine then obviously throw it out the window don't use it but so uh, if you tolerate it well then it's definitely something i would consider yeah yeah the only things i really tell people are kind of like the foundational things and so in in 
when I build a plan are going to be fish oil and uh, vitamin D and if needed, maybe a uh, psyllium husk. And then of course, protein powder. But then the other things that get more specific, like maybe we need more carbs, maybe we want to use pre-workout insulin, then we're definitely going to start an intra-workout carb with an EAA. But that's not going to be well, for I, everyone. You know? I thought this was a non-drug scenario. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, he just said just in general. And I'm just saying these are the things like I or based off of your health markers, like like you said, you know, maybe we need more fish oil or maybe like you use krill or maybe we need citrus bergamot for your cholesterol. But like it's not going to be something that I just tell everybody, hey, you need this. It's based off the individual. Yeah, there's an, definitely an element of that. And like I say, if, if we are talking in a natural scenario, then a good diet is going to negate the need for a lot of stuff. Um, but when you start adding chemicals, the stresses and pressures on the body increase and therefore the requirement to manage that and support that increases. Yeah. Uh, nice to see Dave still looking well. Remember training at Maloney's around 10 years ago and we always knew when Dave was in because we could hear him grunting very loud from the car park. Maloney's was on the fourth floor of an industrial unit, so that gives you an idea of how loud he was. Oh yeah, there's no no denying. I'm not even going to even try and attempt to deny that one. Who was that? That was uh, Gary Barkham. It's not a name I recognise, but I'm not good with names. Oh yeah, I, I about me. I've been barred. I got barred for Maloney's for noise twice, and Did then you? eventually, and then eventually permanently. Yeah. If you went to Maloney's now, do you think they'd let you back in? No, I've already been told I'm not welcome. <laughs> I have never been told that at a gym before. I mean, it came. Oh, I've been, to I've been told that at several gyms. <laughs> we, um, we were at Powerhouse World Headquarters, which is you know Powerhouse Gym, and I had a couple mm -hmm. clients that were getting ready for shows. One of them was a pro, and we went into the aerobics room. And one of the guys who worked there happened to be walking by. And he was like, no, listen, you guys, you can't be doing that stuff here. You can do it somewhere else, but you're not allowed to do that in this gym. We weren't allowed to pose at Powerhouse Gym, World Headquarters. So that, that irritated me, but we didn't get kicked out. I've... I have no issue. The gyms that have barred me over the years, um, I have no issue. At the end of the day, it is their gym. It is their policy. If they don't want a big sweaty grunting mess in there, I fully appreciate that. I have no issue with moving on. Um, the, the funny thing is that I do remember two gyms that were uncomfortable with me training there. Yeah, uh, and they both had the same sort of situation. Look, we don't really have the client base for that style of because I was always and always have been hyper aggressive when I train. It's it's I've always been a very you know into what I'm doing and sort of I wouldn't say deliberately loud because I don't think I am, but I've I've definitely got no no uh, shyness about if if I'm pushing hard of you know making a noise that I'm pushing hard. Um, uh, and the irony of both those situations was that the managers came up and said, look, we, uh, you're not really suitable for this gym. It's not the sort of thing we have. Yeah. Um, you're, you're sort of a bit intimidating to, to the old dears. I could see that. But then I feel the like old, if you go out of your way to talk to those women, then, you know, or, or just the, the folks that aren't part of that circle, then they, they end up liking you. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, wow, well, yeah, the, he's actually a nice guy. And, like, the, the go, go train was, hard. We like that, you know? Yeah, that was the irony. The old women absolutely loved it. Yeah. They used to love me in the corner <laughs> growling and grunting and God knows what else. They used to think it was great. <laughs> yeah. All right. What else do we have here? Um. Okay, I know you looked into this just a little bit. Question for the next show. Have you heard of this new growth hormone that Pfizer came out with? It's a once-a-week shot. Um, what is the update and the negatives of this? Right. Oh, God. Let's try and remember. So, from the studies I've read, the basic current concern is insulin resistance. Yeah. 
Um, and that's on the studies. The studies are actually saying we, we have concerns about potential insulin resistance build up with this administration of growth hormone at this plateau level. Um, I did go into how it worked and everything, but I, I can't, I can't off the top of my head remember without looking back at some notes. Um, but there was a couple of different delivery systems. Yeah. Uh, one effectively wrapped the growth hormone in a, 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 a coating, effectively. And then there was another way of delivering it as well. Um, and I, 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 as I said, I'd have to look back to refresh my memory of what it was because it's not stuck. Yeah. But I and I do remember that there were a, there were a few research studies on it, and the basic concern was it was too early in its use to see if they were going to develop any long term insulin resistance issues. But that was the major concern because it was a non fluctuating dose; it was a plateau dose. So, so effectively, it would elevate your growth hormone levels to a set level, but hold them there. Um, and that's what they were worried about would increase the insulin resistance rather than the exposure to GH in its own right. The fluctuation of GH is what actually, to some extent, offsets insulin resistance buildup. So, um, yeah, that's that's basically where we're at. I mean, from a point of view of does it work? Is it successful in medical trials? Yes. In fact, I believe actually most of the medical trial stuff has come back very successful at this point as an alternative. Hmm. All right. Um, okay. He says, I know you talked uh, about uh, caffeine in T3. Uh, we talked about that just last week. So definitely look at the last episode, brother. This is That's for Kay Barry. Um, he says, uh, does Yohimbine have the same effect as caffeine on t3 i don't know if there's any research done on that i have no idea i honestly don't know i haven't no. got a scooby thoughts on pqq and ubiquinol for mitochondrial support I'll tell you what man so what we found dave with the long flu that i've dealt with now for three years is it's it has a negative impact on your mitochondria basically and mitochondria isn't functioning as well so I found that my my near red light that I have here, uh, near red light sauna, it's definitely beneficial. Helps I can tell because I, when I get better mitochondrial function or use supplements for better mitochondrial function, it clears brain fog. It reduces the symptoms that I get from that long bug. Anyway, um, ubiquinol is one of my go tos. I run it at 400 milligrams a day, every day and I probably will for the rest of my life. I find that to be great. Vitamin D3 to be great at a high dose too. Uh, I do like 30,000 units a day with K. And um, now he mentioned PQQ. I haven't really experimented a ton with PQQ. When I've talked to Vigorous Steve about it, he's made the suggestion of using PQQ with it. I think, I, as a matter of fact, I, I take that back. I did use it for a couple months. I didn't notice a vast difference personally. Do you think, though, it has any any benefit in general bodybuilding terms? PQQ? Or do, you, or do you think it's finite stuff and there's probably a million and one other things that could be improved that would have greater impact? I think for a healthy individual, it might be kind of one of those finite things. Um, Ubiquinol is a great... Reaction. Yeah, it's ubiquinol reaction, is great, But though. I don't know enough about it. Right. Okay. But I don't think you need 400 milligrams. That stuff's expensive, man. The price has gone up a ton. Since I discovered it, I paid like, so taking, I mean, most caps come in 100 milligrams and you get like 60 of them. So that's a month's supply of 200 milligrams and it's like $40, man. So if I'm taking 400 milligrams, I I just bought a big old bottle of it for like 100 bucks. It's going to last me like two, three months. It adds up, you know. You need to start getting it wholesale, mate. Yeah, I need to find somebody who knows how to do that. But then you'd have to mail it to me, and then there'd be all sorts of, you know, issues with that. Okay, this is a weird question. Uh, is it a benefit to switch from one milliliter of test sip every five days? Switch that to 0.5 test with 0.5 mast E and 0.5 EQ, and doing that every five days. I ask for a friend because he is scared about his libido. 
you'll have to say that again. So he's just doing one mil test sip every five days, and he's mm-hmm. thinking about switching that to 0.5 test, 0.5 mass D, and 0.5 EQ. So probably like 100 EQ, 100 mast, and 125 sip every five it days. Was- it would just depend on how impacting the EQ potentially was on his estrogen. And mast, which I don't think is yeah, but, that effective as an AI. No, it, it, it's, like I said, from what I've seen blood-wise, um, I mean, I know people with it's lowered their t- uh, test estrogen levels in, but in general, for, for most people, it seems to act like a CERM rather than an AI. Um, but obviously... It does seem to be a much more broad spectrum um, ER blocker rather than the because obviously your serms are selective, so they're they're agonist mm. and anti agonist. Mass seems to be a little bit non selective. It seems to have a much more broad, broad spectrum blockage pattern around ER receptors. So I think when you mix an AI control with mass, sometimes even though the physical estrogen levels aren't super low, the impact can be much more than you realise. Um, we know EQ is a bit of a funny one. We know in some people it can absolutely slam estrogen. In others, it seems to have no bloody effect whatsoever. Um, so my only concern about that would be is just seeing how he reacted from an estrogen point of view. Oh, everything else from a, from a test THD, whatever. I don't have any concerns about that whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, what do you think the gains are going to be like from it? Well, it's a very low dose, so they're not yeah. going to be huge. But comparative to what he has experienced, they're probably going to be noticeably more. Yeah. I, I would imagine, if nothing else, estrogen is going to be a lot lower just simply because you're taking less less mm. test and less compound that converts. Your total milligram is going to be higher, but you only have half as much as, that will convert to estrogen as you did before, really. Yeah, there's that, but we also don't know if he's running any estrogen management currently with what he is doing. So, But, yeah, I... I I think you'll see some positive benefit. It, it's not going to be, you know, oh, my God, but um, I definitely think he's going to see some positive benefit. We've got 21 people watching. Is that a record? I don't know. Hey, but we usually don't go to the YouTube channel. So, we're, you know, we're usually... Guys, we're on the YouTube Live, the Think Big Live <laughs> channel. Anybody who's watching this post-production on the regular channel, uh, we recorded live every Tuesday... At, uh, at generally around 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is 3 p.m. What do you call your time over there, Dave? Like ours is Eastern time. Standard. Yeah, but we don't have a time zones within the country, so it's all just one time. You just call it like British time or just time? It's just it's just time, but technically it's Greenwich Mean Time. But okay. uh, yeah, because all time is centered around England. Oh yeah, because I'm I'm like five hours plus or whatever, you know. Mm. Very yeah. Mean. Okay. Uh, by the way, you are definitely achieving a very nice red well, look. I can't, I can't tell where your t-shirt ends and you start. <laughs> I feel it, dude. I feel it. Hundred micrograms <laughs> of melanin too. Whoo, buddy. The, thankfully, the stomach feeling is starting to subside, and drinking drinking my water is helping with that too. <laughs> I got a new shaker cup over the weekend. I got it from Tino at um, RTB Gym. Look at that. It's an insulated shaker cup. Wow. Like it's pretty cool, man. It's got it's like a thermos. I have me um, Yeti cup for that. Yeah, those are overpriced. Far oh, are they? I went mental when, when the wife boy. I was like, what are you spending <laughs> all that money for? Yeah. But... I have to admit, it is pretty freaking impressive, actually. All right. I see we have a few more in the live stream. We'll get to those. Um, What about this one? It says, uh, hey, guys, what are your thoughts on low-dose beta agonists during the off-season? Something like 20 to 40 clen or a comparable dose of albuterol due to the shorter half-light. He says, to mitigate fat gain in the off-season, 
He said used with uh, L-carnitine and fasted cardio. Just sort your diet out and stop. No, no, no. Sorry. I, I get that. You know, these drugs are available and they do make life easier for us and we can get away with being less adherent and stuff. But to me personally, and no offense to, to the listener, that is a very unnecessary step and I feel a step too far. Um, no, is my opinion on that one. Sorry. So I've worked with... So Scott Stevenson knew a lady who used Yohimbine to help stave off fat gain. I work with a guy, he struggles to put on muscle without putting on a lot of fat. We've been experimenting with L-carnitine and Yohimbine in the off season. And I think that we're kind of getting a formula down. Kind of like, you don't want to do an hour of cardio every day in an off season. You know, it's too much. But is there a small amount of cardio that's going to kind of offset fat gain? Yes. And it's finding that balance. And I so we're experimenting with finding that balance using L-carnitine and a low dose of Yohimbine. Clen, it's a step further. I don't think I'd go there personally. Yeah, I, I just think it's a step too far personally. I, 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 I'm sorry if, if I've upset anyone or insulted anyone, but I just think it's a step too far. You insult me every week, Dave. So Yeah, that? you don't count. You're a fucking tomato. I feel like one right now, too. I do. I feel like one. I almost was like, oh, this is no big deal. Why don't I do two squirts of it? I'm really glad I didn't do that right now. I'm really disappointed you didn't do that. I actually think <laughs> you need to do another one. Don't peer pressure me, Dave. I want to see how red we can get you. All right. So we had another guy, another gyno question. He said both of his sons are dealing with uh, pubescent gyno. Uh, and and is there anything that he can do outside of outside of the surgery for them? Well, obviously, speak to a GP doctor. It depends on which country he's in. Yeah. Um, I mean, over the counter wise, dim. Yeah, maybe. Um, I mean, it might not reverse it, but it might. You might be able to keep yourself have. from you know getting worse. I don't yeah. Know. If, if, you're, if you're looking at stuff you can buy over the counter or things you can do on a base level that isn't medication-based, yeah, then I would say lower body fat, over the counter dim, um, and just watch their diet for soy products and stuff like that. Um, they're all finite things. They're not going to have huge, huge impacts, but the combination could have a positive impact. Lowering body fat would definitely be a big one for that. Um, but really, if, if they've got pubescent gyno and they've, they're, they're struggling with it, then I would seek medical attention. A lot of times, the doctors don't do anything about it. You know, they like they don't they aren't even aware. Mm, I, it, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, but uh, you can shout and kick and scream a bit as well at them. Yeah. I find but, usually going to practice managers and threatening negligence paperwork uh, helps. All right, that's some good good advice. Uh, James has another one for us. He says, uh, "Quick question, gents: Is stretching important before or after training, and does it contribute much to muscle growth?" After. I agree. After uh, DC training, they use weighted extreme. Dante called it extreme stretches. Those were beneficial. I'm someone asked about dc and i'm not the biggest fan of dc um in its purest form why not no i think it's i think for most people firstly generating the intensity required most people struggle with that's what dante's point was always that you needed to be advanced in order to do yeah. dc and i also think that for a lot of people it puts them in an injury prone state because they aren't controlled and self-managed enough to maintain the four dis form discipline that needs to be maintained you so definitely it's not have to be advanced a, it's not that i have a problem with dc training in its in itself it's more the wholesale application of dc training that i have uh, issues around in that a lot of people do it incorrectly uh, and therefore it becomes a negative but dc stretching I think is very, very good and can be implemented by pretty much anybody. Um, but yeah, stretch after. Now, the way this was explained to me, very simple, but I think it works very well, is muscle fibers. 
if you stretch before what you do is this and as a result you reduce contractile strength yeah post training they look a bit like that okay and they're tight and they're all bunched and they're, they're a bit of a mess by doing stretching particularly weighted stretching you open them out which then allows increased blood flow through the fiber and better nutrition to get through the fiber and speeds up the recovery process of the muscle so that's how it was explained to me yeah the, the majority of stretches i've done had been while following early mountain dog plans because meadows would often have a stretch sometimes the stretch would be part of the workout for instance um we would do a like a dumbbell pullover second to last up exercise and then we do uh like lower back stuff like uh, hyper extensions so like you do pull down you so basically john's idea was the first exercise was to like really warm the muscle up get all the tissues feeling mm-hmm. good second exercise was your meat and potatoes movement heavy hard third exercise is now volumize as much blood into the muscle as you can followed by a stretch and so sometimes that stretch would be an exercise like a dumbbell pullover focusing on the stretch other times it would be like a a superset like you're doing one exercise and then at the end of that you go and you hang from a pull-up uh body weight for 30 seconds you know something Mm -hmm. like that and i'm a big fan as well i think those things are good and they will benefit you for muscle growth all mm-hmm. right, let me see what else we had here in the stream. Um, hey, guys, what's your opinion on Metaform-type products? Can they lead to noticeable long-term growth in the area? So that's the hyaluronic acid SEO. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, from what I, I understand, uh, you may have looked at this a bit more in depth than me. I didn't. Um is it's not growth full stop so what it does is it volumizes the cell with water and the difference with hyaluronic acid is that that water can stay in that cell for very extended periods of time um in some cases i know the studies were done on cosmetic stuff and in some cases that that cellular volumization could last 12 months uh, I've not seen anything study-wise on whether that time frame is shortened due to exercise. So with muscular contraction or anything shortens that volumization of the cell. But effectively what you're doing is shoving water in a cell. Um, and as far as I'm aware, that has no benefit in the sense of actually muscular growth whatsoever. But maybe I'm wrong. Because I say I haven't looked at it in any depth. I used it once. They were uh, considering, they wanted to advertise one of the products. I won't say the name of the brand. Wanted to advertise with their podcast. So they sent me out a bunch. And I was like, okay, I'll try it. So I do these bicep shots. The instructions were one milliliter per head per week. And I do that and like get nothing out of it. And it turned out, talking to people, you had to use, that was kind of like the ad, was like, oh, it's easy. It's one milliliter per head per week, and it's going to bring in 500 times its volume in water, 5,000 or 5 million times. I can't remember, right? And then I found out people were telling me, oh, no, you got to use a lot more than that. It's like traditional SEO. And that's when I gave up on it. I tried doing more, and I I did see some inflammation volumization but it was minor and i didn't want to keep up with it it's just not my thing you know it's it's too much no i i from from my understanding is there's no actual muscular growth what you're doing is swelling the individual cells to their max capacity sure that there is some stuff oh god i'll try and remember this right that doing that long term can actually damage the cell but i can't remember exactly Hmm. what it was well i do know that traditional seo at least will damage the muscle i know a guy who he had uh um issues that's that's oil oil based isn't it yeah he had issues with one of his biceps he's a pro and so it, it didn't have the same shape so he started pumping that one up and he would do that like eight weeks out from competition to create more of a symmetry. You wouldn't know that his bicep was smaller 
just by looking at them unless you knew. You know what I mean? Once you see it, you couldn't unsee it, but it's not the first thing you saw. Anyway, now, a decade later, he has noticed it's kind of gone necrotic, like that muscle is breaking down faster. Yeah, there's. I do remember reading something on the hydro. Uh, the, the 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 long term volumation of cells could actually damage the cells, hmm. um, but um, I can't remember the specifics because I say it's something I've not looked at for a very long. I mean, I I don't know. It's been out for a long time now. Yeah, this was oil based though. The one I, hmm. I'm speaking of, and I have heard people that I respect say they believe there is. A relationship between SEO use and kidney problems. A lot of the big bodybuilders, a lot of the big pros that that have had to go in for kidney problems were also doing massive doses of SEO. So there is that no. possibility. I don't know. It's got to pass through there. So it, it's it's definitely possible. Yeah. All right. How about this one from the live stream? Thoughts on IGF DES and or IGF LR three any good or expensive pump product i know I you're not a lot of no expensive pump product yeah i like dell r3 i i do feel like there was some volumization here's what i learned though dave so obviously in bodybuilding we want high G igf right but mm -hmm. in um uh, what do you call it like like the rejuvenation people they yeah, want they low IGF. It. Yeah, because yeah. IG, high IGF leads to a shorter lifespan. But low G, IGF leads to lower muscle mass. Dr. Rhonda Patrick did this uh, talk she called the IGF trade-off, where mice were uh, the, who had IG, IGF uh, had more muscle mass but lived shorter. Um, mice that weren't given IGF had less muscle mass but lived longer. So is your better quality of life for shorter better or you know lower quality of life lower ability to move through the world with strong muscle but live longer which which do you want you know i want to ask a question and i don't know if it's just something that i've made up in my head yeah but i have the general feeling that long-term users of gh within bodybuilding appear to prematurely age oh, which, is sort of which is sort of counterproductive because obviously growth is used as a, a use serum and an anti-aging product but it's used at low dose for that high dose i have the suspicion that it is actually quite aging yeah and i, I, won't be I don't know if i I've just seen a lot of guys that are big GH users that look 10, 15 years older than they actually are. And I don't see the equivalent, though you do see some aging in, in, in anabolic users. I don't see the equivalent in people that are using anabolics, but not hammering the GH at the same extent. Yeah. Um, Rhonda Patrick also said she suspected that uh, athletes, and she was just speaking just in general, not just bodybuilding, athletes that used IGF may have be more likely to, to have issues that they wouldn't have had with cancer otherwise. Um, and, and I've heard Eric Serrano talk about IGF and growth hormone, that if you use growth hormone and your IGF levels go up, there's kind of a system of checks and balances that keep that IGF in check. Whereas what we worry about with IGF is that we have cells that mutate in, in our bodies every day. Mm -hmm. They're constantly turning over. Cells mutate. Our bodies say, oh, that cell is mutating. Let's zap it. We kill it. And it's gone. IGF on the other hand. And if, if it doesn't do that, if that cell continues to grow, that's what we call cancer, that mutated mm -hmm. cell. Uh, in a healthy body, we zap those off every day. The fear is that IGF, which that's what grows these cells, may continue to grow that cell that would have otherwise been killed off i know I someone know. i don't who know had, i know someone who suffered with stomach cancer um had to have a large portion of the stomach removed and he had a, a very open surgeon doctor consult uh, and he admitted that he'd used growth and the surgeon did feel that though it didn't cause it, it accelerated it. It would certainly accelerate it. If you have, mm. if you have the big C 
and you're using growth and or IGF, that will definitely be like gas on a fire. I knew a yeah, guy that see. had uh, brain cancer and he was a big IGF fan. So I'm not going to say that there was a correlation there, but I, I would assume he was still pushing because he was still pushing hard until things kind of went sideways. And I imagine that that freaking tumor was probably growing there for a while before he knew, you know? Well, let's be right. Most people discover cancer when it's got to a point where it becomes problematic. They don't generally discover cancer in its infancy. True. So there's a strong chance you've sped up the spread and development of that cancer because it isn't until it becomes problematic you actually find out it's there because that's when you start presenting symptoms and and then start looking at Ooh, what's the problem so all uh, the more reason yeah. to keep getting lab work done and and keep up with your you know your physicals at your doctor dave how's your cardio dave. it's the it's the thing i do in the morning that i hate but you yeah, so you're, getting, you're doing it yeah, I mean, I've had a few miss because I've had to go away or whatever. I was like, I've got a Glasgow Thursday. I won't be doing any Friday morning or anything. But, yeah, you know, it's getting done. I did it this morning as well. Still hate it. Still loathe every second on that bike, but I do it. Do you have any uh, Uncle Dave's advice or wisdom, Uncle Dave's wisdom for the day? I have a very short one. Okay, okay. Dave, can prepare. A very, a very simple one, and I, I don't know if I've touched on this because I end up going off on tangents as we discuss every week and cover all sorts of crap. Most people who do you wrong are not driven by the thought or idea to do you wrong. They're driven by the thought and idea to do something for themselves, and you end up being the shrapnel from that. That's good. So most people aren't driven to wrong you. They're driven to sort themselves, but don't think of the consequences it has to the people around you. Hmm. I think about that sometimes if I get cut off on the road. The guy wasn't intentionally like trying to, you know, slight me. He just was thinking of what he wanted to do. Yeah, when well, he didn't consider you in that. Yeah, and and that's what a lot of. Oh, don't get me wrong. There's there's people that will do. You know, if someone runs up and punches you in the face. They probably did it because they want to hurt you and you piss them off. So there is there is yeah. direct. But when you get you know, it's like people you don't know or, or people just do shit that causes you problems. It's generally out of their own preservation or their own desires rather than any desire to screw you over. What made you think of that one? I don't know. It just popped in my head today for some reason. You remember that guy who said we looked like Ren and Stimpy? Yeah. He said, or I don't think he said we looked like them. He said we are like them. We are like, you know, a great, a great team. Like, like, was what, was, like the was, classics. Was, was one of them incredibly red? Uh, yeah, but that was Ren, and that would be you. You're Ren. I'm Stimpy. Well, <laughs> something's gone wrong there. <laughs> He said, uh, he said, uh, what did he say here? He says, crying, laughing, seeing my comment pop up on the show. Nice to be a celebrity in my own household, if only for a minute. <laughs> it made my day. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. All right, Dave, what do you got going on today? What are you doing? Uh, I'm just looking at the, the large number of messages that have popped up on my screen while we've been doing the podcast. All right. So my first my first immediate thought is to go for a pee. Yeah, I think I'm going to go like soak in like a cold uh, shower for a few. <laughs> try to cool myself down here. Whew, that was not that was way more than I expected. I'm going to say that much right now. So you can, at least you can you can you can state that the product definitely is well dosed. Yeah, that is true. That. That is true. And 100 micrograms does plenty for me, at least. <laughs> Guys, check out truenutrition.com. Use our code THINK and supplementsource.ca for Canadians because they have great deals that change week to week. If you're in the UK, you can go over to Strom Sports Nutrition, get some great health and performance supplements there. Plus, you can get your lab work done by Dave if you're in the UK. Go to evalbloodanalysis.com. And uh, thank you to everybody from Patreon, guys. You guys are doing a hell of a job to make sure that this can show continues to happen and uh, supporting everything we do. We appreciate you guys. For another episode of Drugs and Stuff with Dave Crossland, we will see you soon. Thanks, Dave. Pleasure.